Welcome to another edition of Coffee Cats. In this series, we're covering an introduction to soil testing and soil fertility. This installment covers collecting soil samples. So when we talk about soil testing, we're actually talking about four separate activities. Soil sampling, going out and actually getting the soil. Soil analysis, sending it off to the lab and getting results back. Interpretation of those results, and finally making recommendations. In this edition, we're talking just about collecting that soil sample, which is traditionally viewed as the limiting function when managing uh, fields, because we're, we're trying to manage towards the average. Uh, when you send that sample off to the lab, they're using one teaspoon to come up with a number that represents the whole field you just sampled. And so the results and the interpretation of those results and the recommendations are only as good as the sample that is submitted to the lab. When we talk about variable rate or precision ag, we often grid sample and interpolate between the points, which presents its own challenges. So in traditional soil sampling, you're trying to provide the average nutrient status of a field or an area of a field. We recommend that you submit one sample that represents 10 or 20 acres. Um, if your field is very variable, you'll want to submit more than one um, sample for that field. So if we look at this example down here in the left hand corner, um, we're showing that we took and broke that field up into basically three different samples. And yet those areas that you represent could be differences in soil texture, they might be differences in uh, the soil color or the soil slope of the field or the drainage in that field. Um, it might be past management. Maybe there's a tobacco patch that used to be in that field or an animal or livestock holding area that you know about and so you would sample those separately because they're going to be different. If you also have a trouble spot or a very unusual spot you may want to sample that separately as well. Um, but the most important thing is, is to be consistent in how you sample to the depth um, and collecting a lot of cores per sample. So one sample that is sent off to the lab should be at least 12 soil cores using a soil probe. And you would zigzag across that area, sticking the probe in the ground 12 times, putting it in a bucket, mixing it up, and sending that off to the lab. And finally, one thing that I will mention is uh, drawing a map and, and, and keeping good records. So those records are the most important thing. When people come to me with soil test results, if they have results for just one year, uh, there's not much I can tell them. But if they've taken samples every third year or every other year or even every year, we can look at the history of the soil test results. And if they came from the same areas in the field, we can then start to draw some conclusions about the nutrient management plan and how that field specifically reacts to input. So those records and keeping a map of where the samples are collected is really important. So let's talk actually about how to collect the sample. In this image you can see here that we've got a, uh, a soil probe. That's the best way to collect a sample and you can keep the depth real consistent. In fact when when uh, I collect samples, we have a, uh, a little rubber donut that we bolt onto that soil probe, like you would put on an air compressor hose to keep it from retracting up into your shop ceiling. And uh, we put that little donut on that soil probe and it keeps our depth consistent, which is very important because soil properties tend to be stratified. When samples are collected too deep or too shallow, the results are skewed. This has a huge impact. Even if you're only an inch off of the recommendation, it can have a big impact. And then interpretation and recommendations for most crops and soil properties are calibrated to that acre furrow slice. So what depth is that? Well, in pastures and no-till, we're looking for a four-inch sample. And in tilled areas, we want to represent the tillage depth, which is typically about six to eight inches. Folks often say, well, you know, my roots are deeper than that. It doesn't matter. When we talk in, in later installments about soil test correlation, it's important to remember that that soil test was correlated through, you know, scientific experiments to this specific depth. And so it's the sample that was used when the soil test recommendations were made. That's the depth we're shooting for. Soil sample collection. You want to mix it well in a clean plastic bucket. Whatever you do, don't use a galvanized bucket because uh, the, the materials they use to galvanize that bucket, the zinc, will uh, give you bad results uh, from the soil test lab. 
You want to make sure it's really thoroughly mixed. Again, it's only a teaspoon that's going through the, the lab for analysis. And so when they reach into that box or that bag that you submit it to the lab, you want to make sure that it is uniform from top to bottom in the bag. So mix it real thoroughly in the bucket. Crush up all those soil cores and then put a sub sample into your bag that is uh, very representative of the area sample. When you collect that sample, it's only about a pint that's going off to the lab. So the other thing I want to point out here is if you have to dry the sample, you'll see in this picture we were collecting some samples when it was just pouring rain and standing water in the field. That is never a good idea, but in research sometimes you have to do those crazy things. But if you have a sample that's a little bit wet, don't let it sit on the dashboard of your pickup truck and cook. You want to dry it before it goes off to the lab so it's not sloppy wet if you can't get it there right away. But you don't ever want to dry a sample in the oven. You want to air dry it. And then lastly, make sure that you provide all requested information to the laboratory. Soils test timing, soil sample timing is very important. When you collect samples, um, you know, at different times in the spring versus the fall, particularly with potassium, with potassium, you're going to get different results. So the best way to manage is to be consistent. People ask me, when's the best time to soil sample? Well, if you haven't sampled that field in a while, right now is the best time to sample. Make sure you have a current soil test before you add any fertilizer or lime. Otherwise, you're poking around in the dark. But you want to avoid sampling a recently fertilized soil. So the other thing we say is sample as far away from fertilizer or lime application as possible. But sometimes we apply some fertilizer in the fall, some in the spring. And so with pastures, we might be applying any time of the year. All I can say is get as far away from the most recent fertilization as possible. Um, typically, you can do it about six months after fertilization. In my opinion, for a routine agronomic soil test, fall is generally the best time. Because first of all, the labs are not very busy. So your result is going to be better because they're more careful with the sample. Second of all, your result will be coming back to you quicker because they're not as busy. And generally, you're going to have all fall to order the materials you need to address fertility issues because the best time to apply fertilizer is in the spring right before the crop needs it. When we talk about soil sampling for precision ag, we're talking about breaking up a field into smaller management zones. Just like at the beginning when we were talking about traditional soil sampling and we were just kind of picking out zones based on topography or previous management. The most common precision ag method of soil sampling is grid point. There's also grid sample, grid cell sampling. So with grid point, you're setting up a grid. Maybe it's two and a half acres. That's the most common. Maybe you're doing a really good job and you're going to one acre, but you're sampling at the intersection of that uh, grid that you've, you've laid out. With grid cell, you actually zigzag across that two and a half acre cell. And uh, grid sampling is good when you combine multiple fields into one large field, when uh, previous management is what's altered the soil nutrient levels, so not natural variation, but instead human induced. But I'm going to cover in a second here some real drawbacks to grid sampling and why we're probably doing it wrong. Now direct sampling, most commonly called zone management, is probably the best way to do precision ag management. But again, there's some drawbacks because it requires other data, either you're using yield maps, remote sensed imagery, other sources of spatial data, maybe it's soil texture. Uh, that you have or, or um, something with the elevation, the topography. But you've got to have experience with that field to know if the zones make sense and someone has to work with each field in, individually to break up the zones. When uh, we have commercial folks coming in to sample our fields, it's most common to use that grid approach because the person doesn't have anything, know anything about the field. They can just put an untrained soil sampler on a four-wheeler and send them out to collect that grid sample. But this is where we get into trouble. When we do grid sampling, you have to interpolate the values. So you, you, if you, we look back here, um, we see that you know we have this known value where we collected a sample, and then we have this unknown value in between that we are trying to figure out uh, what the value is. And so we use interpolation to come in here and and guess the value of this unknown area, right? So we did we didn't collect a sample here but we're going to interpolate based on the areas we did sample to kind of predict what the value is there at that unknown location. But we run into some problems because when we interpolate, it's a statistical procedure and it requires that the correlation factor, this 
R value that we see on the vertical axis of this figure is at least 0.3. And separation distance is how far is the distance between each point that we sample. When we sample at a two and a half acre grid, we have, if we look at this grid, a 100 meter separation distance. That's a two and a half acre grid. If we sampled at a quarter acre, that would be 30 meters. One tenth of an acre would be 20 meters. And what these researchers found out in this paper here is that to interpolate, the samples must be collected close enough that the R value is at least 0.3, which requires a separation distance of 30 meters or a quarter acre or less. And so if we're sampling at two and a half acres, the interpolated value is meaningless. It absolutely has no value whatsoever. And in fact, the interesting thing that they found, and other researchers have since duplicated, and we've done the research here in Kentucky as well, and seen the same thing, is that if you sample on a two and a half acre grid, often just taking the average of all those samples, will be closer to the true value of that unknown point than the interpolated value. Let me say that again. Taking the average of your grid point results is better than the interpolated map that is put out by even a really tight sample at like a one acre grid. So why is that? It's because at the small scale, soil properties tend to be stochastic. Stochastic means that those properties are random such that they can be predicted accurately, but not necessarily precisely. What's the difference? Well, on average, when you make an interpolated map, if I average all these values, they're right. But at every single point, the interpolation is wrong. And that's the same thing with soil properties. Our results, our recommendations are based on a field average. But, you know, that average is just the middle value. And since soil properties can vary widely in short distances, when we go back and look at this example here, this one value here, this 45, in that interpolation would throw off the prediction of this value. And so in fact we're better taking all these values and averaging them rather than interpolating because you have this random noise. Unless you take a sample at a quarter acre grid which is just too costly. We'd never be able to do that. So we have some problems with precision ag and grid sampling. We need to try and do zone management but it can be tricky. So in summary we need to adequately represent our area with as many cores per sample as possible. We tend to say 10 or 12 cores per sample. Uh, if you can do 20 cores in a sample, that's even better. Sample depth is critical. If you sample too shallow or too deep, your fertilizer recommendations are going to be wrong. Sample at roughly the same time each year. You can't compare samples collected at different times of the year. You can't compare a spring sample to a fall sample, particularly for potassium but for other nutrients as well. And finally, interpolated grid samples can be tricky. We're not sampling grid sampling at dense enough. Two and a half acres, one acre, not good enough. Going denser than that would be too costly and time consuming. Generally with precision ag, it's better to try and do zone management, but that requires the user to know something about the field and spend time with that field to set up the zones.